Uh, this is Patrick McCarthy reporting with Tri-Cities Community Television. We're in our Fountainhead Studios here on Westwood in Port Coquitlam. We're on the unceded territories of the Coquitlam First Nations, and we still thank them for allowing us to conduct our interviews in that space. Today, as part of the Municipal Update, we have Councillor Dennis Marsden, who's here, and he's going to give us a quick update. I know it's been now uh, the end, I call the end of the COVID um, term is in that sense. I know a second. And so for folks who obviously you've been in council almost eight years now, you're going into your third third term. What Can you explain to people what's kind of happened over the last four years with COVID and then City of Coquitlam? Well, thanks, Patrick. I appreciate you coming here. And, and, and thanks, first off, to, for acknowledging our First Nations, uh, Coquitlam First Nations, and, and uh, the fact that they honor us to, to be here. So thank you very much for that. Um, it has been, the, the word unprecedented hasn't been overused. It's been used excessively, but you can't overuse it. It has been un, unusual. Um, we've seen different cities react in different ways. Um, but I, I would preface it this way. We've been talking to our staff about developing a work from home program that looked like it was going to take probably six months to get council approval, do all the reports, a year to kind of review how we're going to execute it, and then make it happen. 18 months. On March 15th or March 17th, it happened. Yeah. In seven days, we had 400 staff working from home. Amazing, yeah. So what typically would take bureaucracy 18 months was done in seven days. So hats off to our staff to, to make it happen, to make it as seamless as possible, to ensure that we can deliver the services. Um, recreation services, the, the change in, in there has just been just dramatic. Um, so it was at the flick of a switch change how you operate, which is exactly the same as every business that's out there, every household. We had to change how we lived. We had to change how we operated. We had to change and um, our comfort zones became very much enclosed and capsulized. So it was, it was dramatic. Um, and then very quickly, we had to switch to, okay, what's our role? What do we need to do to ensure that we're delivering the services to residents? Um, and, and how do we provide those supports? So obviously water, sewer, traffic continues. Um, but what are the pieces that have to be true to make it happen? So re reviewing uh, contracts with our union, our staff, to say how do we impact them as least as possible? How do, we, how do we look and make sure that we manage things in a way that things can be as normal as possible? Um, it's, it's not something any um, group has ever really had to look at before. Mm. And municipalities across the province, across the country, across the globe, had to turn on a dime. It's, it was, it was eye-opening. You truly recognize the skill sets that you've got within your city when you, when you can do that. So uh, some of the cities though, you know, like Vancouver, for example, were, were kind of, because they offer a lot of other services, not core services to their citizens, were really challenged with, you know, sort of uh, their budgets. So is there anything you can say about the Coquitlam budget that sort of in a sense, you know, prepared you or allowed you to kind of be flexible when it came to this, this, this epidemic? Well, actually, it was. Um, you know, obviously, every city operates their budget. You have to operate at a balanced budget. You can't run a deficit, so we were comfortable there. Um, we typically have a small surplus annually, which is related to vacancies, you know, staff positions that were budgeted for but hadn't been filled. Um, and so we were able to look, and in this particular case, it was about $5 million. Mm -hmm. And so we were able to look and I, I talked to staff, I talked to my colleagues and said, let's create something that we can give back to residents, figure out what they need. And so we challenged staff. Uh, we authorized, pre-authorized up to $5 million in that surplus spending. So normally we go into capital projects. We said, let's set it aside. Let's figure out what residents need. Uh, and they came up with a, a series of programs, uh, grant programs for everything from childcare to, you know, our library, um, our Evergreen Cultural Center, looking and saying what additional supports they have, what additional costs do they have as a result of COVID that we might be able to help relieve that burden. So in the case of the library, it was close to $100,000 in, um, in additional costs to ensure that they could disinfect the books, to ensure that they could operate. Ours was one of the very few libraries in the province that continue to operate services. No, their do while their doors were closed, they were able to provide service to residents um, with pickup services. Mm -hmm. And so it was pieces like that that we were able to, to do. Um, and then as we started to come through it and recreation centers started to open up, we were able to provide uh, reduced cost entry. Again, get people back into the rec centers, get, get people back into, as, as, again, as close to 
their regular lifestyle as possible. Our budget and how we've managed it in the fiscally prudent way we've been enabled us to do that. Um, and we, we've received good recognition from, from peers across the province, um, recognizing that you know uh, some of the programs we put in place, they looked and said, okay, how do we emulate that? It was, I don't want to call it successful because it was a pandemic. Mm. But uh, I think in, in terms of how our team stepped up, how our staff stepped up, it was just absolutely spectacular. So I, I know, um, you know, as a successful counselor, you know, people assume that they know you. Uh, and, and if you're on Facebook, which I'm at least once a year on Facebook, I, I know a little bit about you. But for those of you who are, who are really on, on other forms of medium and are just new to the area because it is changing quickly, Absolutely. can you tell us a bit about yourself? So um, I won't say I'm a lifelong Coquitlam guy. I moved here when I was about 13 years old when my, my dad got a, a, finally a permanent placement with his, with his company. I didn't have to bounce around doing relief assignments. So I moved here as about 13 years old, was actively involved in minor hockey. Um, and then uh, had, to re had to retire from a player uh, due to a knee injury the following year. Uh, but it just allowed me to focus on, on refereeing. Mm. So I, I, I set about trying to make a career as a hockey referee. Um, up until last year, uh, when, a, when a young man surpassed me, I was probably the, the one official that had come out of Coquitlam Minor Hockey that advanced the furthest in his career. I uh, was proud that I had refereed the BC Hockey League. Um, fell just short of the Western League. But, um, so that was my passion. Um, if you went to the hockey rink on any night of the week, if you went to Poirier, you would have seen me there. My parents would drop me off at 6 o'clock on Friday, pick me up 10 o'clock Friday night, drop me off at 5 o'clock Saturday morning, pick me up at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, and again, same on Sunday. So hockey was my life. That was it. Um, when I realized it wasn't going to pan out to the NHL, I said I better find something new, and um, I found finance. Uh, yeah, I got interviewed for an opportunity, and... and uh, and hired in a finance company. I just started my career down the path and ultimately as a credit union manager with uh, Coast Capital Savings here in Coquitlam and, and Westminster Savings in Port Coquitlam. So um, just tremendous opportunities to, to do that. And those opened the doors for my giving back with the Hospital Foundation. Um, got to serve there for eight years, um, seven as treasurer. Uh, served the, the uh, Tri-Cities Chamber of Commerce as president in 2007, but policy advisor and, and, and board member for a few years prior to that. And then on to the BC Board of uh, Chamber of Commerce. So really um, kind of a well-rounded piece that wasn't scripted. I'm not one of those guys that came out and said that step one, step two, step three. I really looked and said, what are the opportunities that present themselves to you? And where's your passion? And where do you p truly p believe that you can provide value? Mm. So that's what I've done. Um, it ultimately led to, to uh, politics, um, and I'm, I'm blessed that I received my family's support on that. Uh, you know, I'm married uh, for 20 years, 23 years, Lisa. Um, <laughs> I'll, write that, I'll write that down. Just, yeah. And, uh, you know, uh, we've got two great kids. Uh, Alexis is 21, returned to college after taking a, a break for COVID. She said, you know, I'm ready to go back, and our son just graduated from Simon Fraser. Uh, so he's on his way. Um, so I'm just, I, I have said to my wife several times lately, I'm the happiest I've ever been. I get to give back to my community. I get to serve. I get to give the skills that I have, give them, give them back. And, uh, and I've got the support of my family to do that. It's, it's a great place to be. So, so your finance background, so um, you just, when we talk about affordable housing, I mean, when we hear two kind of terms there, you know, market value housing and affordable housing, and uh, just for yourself, um, what does that mean to you? You know, I think, it, it, unfortunately, the term affordable housing is, is the wrong term. Uh, we talk about it a lot, and, and different levels of government talk about affordable housing. But, you, but it opens up the argument for somebody saying, well, if you make enough, everything's affordable. Right. But that's not the case. So it, it's, it's really trying to identify and create the environment where there is a range of housing options that services the entire financial spectrum, the whole, whole socioeconomic spectrum. So recognizing that there's folks that, are, that need that lower end shelter rate that, that the government provides for $375. We have a need in our community for that. We have a need, uh, and that one's starting to be met a little bit more. We've heard a lot from the province about it. We've got a greater need for rents that are geared to income. So recognizing that if an income level is $2,000 a month or $3,000 a month, we need to ensure the ability to have rents that fit that. The market, uh, the, the standard that CMHC has always used is 30% of that income. So if somebody's making $3,000 a month, 
we need to find rental options at 900. Mm. And if we don't have that available for people, then they're going to struggle. They're going to struggle more than they need to. So that really comes in and saying, okay, how do we, how do we manage that? How do we partner with uh, not-for-profits? How do we get the federal government to the table more to help bring these rents down? Um, there's, a, there's a number of programs that we've got in place that we, we're being recognized as doing very well at. Um, but it's, it's, it's about ensuring you cover the spectrum. So when I got elected first in 2014, zero, zero rental homes were being built in Coquillum. Mm. Zero. And now we're at 15% of the homes that are constructed are rental. Mm. So recognizing that the only way, you know, my son's not going to graduate from university and, and, and buy a $700,000 condo, a $600,000 condo. That's just not realistic. So how do we create the environment that he can move out into a home of his own um, and get out of mom and dad's basement? Because that's what he wants. Yeah. So we, we need to create the environment that's there. We need to champion the province to be more at the table. And I'll give them credit. They've done more than has been done in the past. And the feds, we need to get them to do more. As a city, yeah. we need to continue to participate and partner and find creative solutions. Yeah, so I, I, I appreciate that you threw out the 15% number and, and, and the concept of affordable. But what, what really do you think is, I know Port Moody did some survey and they've got another different number. So when you, when you talk about sustainable business needing people to work there, I mean, yeah. I, I think there's a whole circle of things and, and supply and demand may make sense, but the demand may not be what we're talking locally. It could be well, offshore demand. So, well, and, and, and that's just that finance of that. And, and that's where I think in, in, in we talk about the different pieces, we talk about the offshore demand. The offshore demand isn't necessarily rental. Yeah. That's a buyer. So, um, you know, that's the province, that's the feds have to put in some, some tighter criteria than they currently have to, to address that. Um, and, and then from the city perspective, again, ensure that we've got supply available. The 15% is what's actually being approved in, to, for, for construction. Yeah. Um, that's not saying that's where that number needs to be. Um, in Coquitlam, when we did our review, we had 4,000 purpose-built rental homes in 2014. 4,000, that's it. Mm. Um, now, we are seeing 12,000 currently in the planning or under construction. So three times what we already had, recognizing we need to increase that portion of the market. Um, but I think where I talk about the partnerships is a, a very creative one. The city, the YMCA, and concert properties, and then ultimately 43 housing, share. So um, the city and the Y partnered up with concert to build a new YMCA. Concert's building a, a new rental building alongside that, 30-story rental building. Growing up in Coquitlam, never thought I'd see 30-story rental, but it's here, it's needed, and it's under construction. Take, and a, then, take a picture of it. Yeah, it's beautiful. <laughs> repeat. Exactly. But the part we need to repeat on it is not just that 30 stories of rental, 300 rental units. It's the fact that we brought 43 housing into the picture. And they're going to take and manage 100 of those units. 20 of those units will be at shelter rate, $375 a month. Okay? 50 of them will be at rent geared to income. And the remaining 30 would come in at what they refer to as the CMHC's low end of market. So if market is 17 to 2, they're at 17. And that is, SHARE manages that, 43 housing. The city put in $4 million cash. In addition to the partnership we did, $4 million cash. I stood beside Minister Robinson when, she, when the announcement was made, and they put in $11 million cash. The feds, bless their heart, gave a loan to build the building. They gave a loan that they announced when it was 15 stories in the air. A little late to the game, and they get their money back. So we're in it. Low interest in them. Province is in it, and the feds come in with a low interest loan. They can make it more affordable if they actually put some skin in the game permanently. Go ahead and grant the loan. That's great. But how about some permanent money too? So as a that's one of the solutions. Yeah. So as a finance guy, we're just yeah. we're, I don't think anybody has the right answer. I, I appreciate the the summary update there. I, I know that. Um, uh, before we leave that question again on, on the 15%, so what, you're, what we're indicating is that all the towers that are being built in Millardville and the ones that are being built in Coquitlam have the same formula of 15% of no, rental? No, that 15% is what percentage of all the housing we're doing is rental. Okay, okay. going forward. Go, 
No, no, what, that's what's happening now. Okay. So it isn't a specific, your building has to have that. Mm -hmm. This is what's actually happening. Right. So while some cities are putting in numbers, this is what's going on. The, the piece we're putting in with some of the towers mm -hmm. is saying, listen, you can build a tower X high. If you want to go higher than that, you have to put in rental, you have to put in non-rental, or non-market non rental, or you have to put in three bedroom units. Because those are the three things that as a city we've heard we need more of. Mm -hmm. So, Mr. Developer, you want to build higher? It has to include those. If it doesn't, the answer is no. So that's a way of getting, again, more rental into, into it, purpose-built rental. So how many so, developers are saying, that's amazing, I'm going to take that deal? Uh, the Minister of Housing in the Union of BC Municipality Conference last week yeah. stood up in front of officials from across the province and said, the model and what Coquitlam is doing is right. We that's, need that's to David, do that. That's David Eby. No, not, no, that is uh, Murray Rankin. Murray Rankin. Murray Rankin is currently yeah. there. David is, of course, running for the, the leadership. So, yeah. uh, so Murray Rankin stood up and, and said, this, is, the this the is one of the models that can work. There's more than one model, to your point. Yeah. But uh, this is one that works. Yeah, uh, I, I think, though... It, we, we need to do more. Yeah. We need to do more to get more standalone purpose-built. Mm. Okay, so more purpose-built rental buildings. Um, and, and to do that... It's, we need to be open to it, the province needs to be there, and the feds need to be at the table. So, so it, it's interesting, though, because I know I read the, the UBCM was giving you accolades, you know, of course. But at the same time, you know, we talk about BC housing. So this is kind of a general question in sure. the sense of, you know, if you're a finance guy, you work in the bank. You know, um, BC housing has sort of just got rid of its old whole board, I guess, yeah. got rid of them. Yeah. You know, possible future premier of the province is, is, was on that, you know, running oh. it as a minister. So, and it, to my mind, I'm thinking, uh, sounds like your partnership is is sort of micro, but sort of well, t you know, sort of well well known. But when you get to BC <laughs> Housing, it seems to be like, you know, are we? Why is not the city more involved in the the financial gain and and risk of of being in rental properties or or co-op housing? Because it, it just just really your thoughts about that. Well, the the, the co-op programs have been federal. Um, you know, I think it's a matter of looking to see where the partnerships. So, um, you know, where is the city's space in it? Uh, the city's space is in providing some land for some projects. Obviously, uh, 3030 Gordon, the city provided the land. We've recently put out uh, two requests for proposals for two sites in Coquitlam for um, subsidized seniors housing. We provide the land for a nominal 60-year lease. And by nominal, the definition is a dollar to ten dollars for 60 years. So not-for-profit comes in, builds and operates below market senior housing. We've just put out the RFP earlier this year to have two buildings, roughly 100 to 110 units for seniors. So yeah. we're at the table. Um, so sorry to interrupt. This is a yeah. good point. So so that is that the the sense of the land is still owned by the city. It's, land owned by the city. Six, 60 years, you renegotiate the terms with the with the with, with the, the new lease. Okay, so you, exactly. So it's kind of, a, in a sense, not is to learn from our First Nations uh, brothers and sisters. It's kind of basically saying, don't don't give up the land because I know Coquitlam, you don't have much. We in the past, you sold land or gave away yep. land. So, yeah. So what what changed there? What was that philosophy? What what drove that philosophy of leasing over sell? I I, I think it's recognizing that. Um, by, by going the lease route, we have greater control over what that product's going to be. Right. You know, we know what it's going to be. We, we had a, a, a perfect comparison. We had a developer come to us and say, I want to build a purpose-built rental building here, and this is what we're going to do, and here you go. Off they go. We approved it. Well, CMHC didn't come in with the funding. So now what they wanted to do in terms of below-market rental wasn't achievable because the low interest rate financing wasn't available. So what do they do? They lost the project. Another developer takes, takes them out and comes to us and says, hi, we want to be condos. Not, not the outcome we want. Right. So by looking at some city land and saying, how do we participate? That's part of the solution. Um, you know, advocating for those other projects, the uh, Hoy Creek uh, Housing Co-op, the replacement of Hoy Creek, um, you know, really disappointed that, fa or really happy phase one is up and going. It, it's under construction, it's moving forward, that's great. Really disappointed that it didn't get approved for funding for phase two. BC Housing has said, oh, sorry, we're out of money. 
See us in 18 months. Well, no. It, the housing is needed now. The costs are going to be higher in 18 months. We need to figure out what we need to do to get that housing built now. How do we get those approvals in place now? Um, and that's where experience around the table in terms of who, who we're talking to and understanding this history is critical. Yeah. So those relationships that have been built already, how do we now leverage them? Even though BC Housing is an upheaval, they're going to see a new model. We just want to make sure we say, hey, we're operating well with you. We're getting some results. If the government is happy with the results we're getting, then let's make sure we're moving forward. So again, Minister Rankin's comment to us is, as a government, they should be looking to partner with cities like Coquitlam that are looking and welcoming these housing options instead of trying to push it on people and cities that are pushing back. Yeah. But, but it almost sounds like to me that, you know, we talked about BC Housing just a few minutes ago, they're, they're, they're an impediment in some ways, you know. They're, they're, it seems to me that based on your strategy of implementation, you know, outside of a developer who can't get financing um, or is the wrong partner, you know, as, as a bank person, as a finance person, um, you know, can you see that, can you see a time where the, you, the city becomes more and more the collector of the funds to kind of fund the projects or a different way of looking at finances from a city's perspective? In every other province in the country, that's the way it works. Okay. Uh, we're the only ones with a BC housing model. Um, and, and that, from the federal perspective, is because now you've got something that's closest to it. You know, the, you know let's face it, the province is closer to the situation and, and the issues here in, Co in Vancouver, uh, in Metro Vancouver, than Ottawa is. Right. So that's, that's the mindset. Uh, in, in other cities, they, they deal direct. Um, you know, is, is it an added level of bureaucracy in some regard? Does it certainly eliminate the need to duplicate services? It does. You know, if you've got that expertise at BC Housing, you don't have to have it in every single city. You don't have to replicate it. You know, who's going to manage that for us? You don't, need, you don't suddenly need a, a department with managers and directors and, and multitudes of people when it can be done with, with fewer people. Yeah. Um, so, again, I, I think it's a matter of, of identifying where the priorities are, identifying um, what the solutions can be. When we're on the Hospital Foundation, one of the things we talked about was solutions that you're, you're dealing with and then looking upstream. If you're standing by the river and a baby floats by, you're going to grab the baby and pull it out. You're still standing there, another baby floats by, you're going to grab it and pull it out. At what point do you go up the river, upstream, and say, how are they getting in? And that's where we are with housing right now. We're focused so much on homelessness and trying to address that, and we should, but we need to look upstream. How do we make the housing more affordable for the people that are starting out? for the, the servers in our restaurant, for the retail clerks, for, for the folks at our nail salons, or whatever it might be that are critical to provide the services in our city. Hmm. You know, Makes sense how do we make sure our, our nurses, our firefighters, that can live in our cities? Yeah, or your bus boys. Or your bus boys, <laughs> all these people. We need to ensure that we've got everybody here and, and housing options for them. Yeah. So, so so why is it then, and I, I, I appreciate your com comments about the level of bureaucracy, because sometimes you, the old saying of, like Port Coquitlam, which I come from, doesn't, you know, doesn't use a different sec technique. Yeah. Uh, Port Moody has limited land, they're, they're, but they always see the land value as 100 million and you know, the temptation to sell it. And, uh, but on the Coquitlam side, I'm just, I'm just really intrigued why this lease model, um, is that because you have, you know, I'm giving you kind of some, some soft ones here in the Go sense of, you know, financial uh, knowledge. Because I think the way you're talking, though, I've talked to some people who have very strong financial background and they're stuck between free market finance, you know. Yeah. And, and then you've got the other side saying, you know, it's more left, give it all away for free. Yeah. But, but to me, it's But like, neither one is right. <laughs> no, exactly. But at, the same time, but at the same time, you have to try different things and not lock it out. Yeah. But, but sometimes you see counsel and they're, they're slightly, it's almost like they're learning finance for the first time potentially, or they're, they're not in that space. So, so how, is, how is the Coquitlam Council when it comes to their financial acumen um, and, and, and to look at different things differently? Well, I think it's interesting because when you, when you look at a, a council, it's a board of directors, truly. Um, and, and everybody's got to bring a different skill set to the table. You know, uh, so when you look at councils across the province, across the country, 
Uh, you'll see some folks with a business acumen, some folks with more of a community base, a heart base. You'll see some folks that maybe have a parks or a planning or a multitude of, of skill sets. You need all of them at Sable. Um, but then from the finance perspective, from the budgetary perspective, you need to have an awareness of it and then get everybody to agree to put in place at the staff level the skill set. Because the mayor can't do this. Council can't do this. We can advocate. That's our role. But somebody's got to make the day-to-day -day stuff happen. Somebody's got to have those meetings with BC Housing or, or, or the providers and say, what is this specific project and how do we make it work best for the city mm. and for the residents? So it's a matter of having all those, those pieces there. Um, I, I give credit to our staff to do a great job of onboarding new councillors. Um, we get the opportunity to sit with the, the heads of each department. And the head of our, our finance will say, how much time do you want? And it's not a one-time meeting. You tell me when you want to sit down. I've got time for you. Yeah. We'll, we'll walk through this. What do we need to do? What needs to be true? And, and, and that's the approach that our city manager has, has done, said, let's make sure that our council and our staff are aligned. Because when you can do, have that alignment, then you can move things forward. We've got some examples throughout in, across Metro where that alignment isn't there. You know, and just go on Twitter and you'll see some yeah, of them. Yeah. Um, it's good reads. Uh, you know, there's some really good reads. Yeah. Um, but I think it's really building that alignment. So, yeah. um, and the one thing that's happened, having been part of two councils now, is that respect for each other to look and say, where are that person's skill sets? I may not agree with them, but where are their skill sets? Where should, if they say something, maybe I need to defer to them a little bit more. Yeah. Uh, and I think our, our council has done that very, very well. I, I truly enjoyed serving with Chris Wilson. Great guy. Yeah. Uh, passion for this, the housing file. So we talked a lot about how we merged my financial background with that passion to create solutions. Yeah. And then give the guidance to staff to go find them and make it work with the blessing of all our council. So you, you, once you once you have it affordable, I just yeah. kept kept talking. Yeah. So we're down to three minutes, really. Oh I'm wow. Getting, we're getting the signal here. So I know you a couple things for yourself is uh, I'll let you just rattle off safety. You know, is on your platform. Yeah. Environment yourself. You know, you're a sports kind of guy, outdoorsy, yeah. and transportation, which we know about. So so I'm going to touch on environment very very quickly. Uh, first ever environmental sustainability plan just completed, and what we'll leverage out of that, we've got the RFP out now, is to build the climate action plan identifying the specific steps we need to take to get to, to zero by 2050, to ensure that we reduce our GHGs from 2007 by 45% by 2030. We've got some plans to get there, um, and, and, and now it's a matter of executing those plans. Community safety, the, um, speed on the streets, sidewalks, the fact that we're investing money every year to bring sidewalks to parts of the city that never had them. So. So we can have situ we can have moms and dads out walking their kids, and safely. I think that's really important. Uh, one of the ones things I've, I've talked about is being responsive. So um, I had uh, residents reach out to me about some challenges in the neighborhood. We put together a program that resulted in 200 intersections being made safer with letdowns, so they're accessible, um, with fresh paint, with, with cleaning up, and just making them safer. Um, and then up at Coma Lake Village, tractor trailers were leaving Coma Lake Village parking lot, heading south onto Regan and taking a 45-foot tractor trailer down a residential side street. Beautiful. <laughs> Principal came to me, parent from the pack came to me and said, how do we fix this? Well, we talked to our engineers, we came up with a solution. Now they come head north and there's now an intersection at Montrose. Are more lights the, the answer? Not always. In this case though, it keeps the kids leaving the school walking along Regan safe from a tractor trailer. That's the, what, some of the things I mean about community safety. Okay, so I, I appreciate that insight. But if, again, you're, uh, you're going into your third term, yeah. you know, I, I've just moved into the city. Yeah. Um, what, uh, what do you say to the folks that may not know you, and, and, and what do you say to get them to vote for you? Well, I, I think uh, what, I, what I ask is take a look at the folks that have, have looked and said, you know what, I've reached out to Dennis, I've reached out with a challenge, any response. You know, we don't always agree but we're gonna to work to try and come up with a solution. And, and that's the piece that I, I've truly provide, uh, prided myself on, is, is to ensure that we can work together. Many of them are technical solutions we engage staff on, um, but typically what I'll do is reach out to that resident and say, you know, I, I got your letter, staff are working on it, let's take a look at the response. If it doesn't achieve what we want, let's revisit on how we can, how we can make it even better. Yeah. 
So it's about responsiveness, it's about openness, it's about being there with, with an ear to, to talk to you about what your specific challenges are and how we can make your experience here in Coquitlam better, make you feel welcome. Well, thank you for coming in. I always feel like every time we chat, I should do an hour, not half an hour. So, and uh, so I thank you very much for coming in. Uh, Patrick, I appreciate your time always. Anytime. Thank you. So that's Dennis Marson. He's running for re-election in the city of Coquitlam. If you want to learn more about Dennis Marson, check out his social media platform. And again, uh, check all our other videos on councillors for the municipal update for, or municipal election actually, for 2022 on October 15th. Thank you very much for watching.